First of all, he's covered in blood. But note here that John explicitly mentions that his followers have been given new, clean, white robes to wear to battle on pristine white horses. And that means this isn't battle blood. This isn't the blood of his enemies that Jesus wears. Everything is pristine white. This is Jesus' blood. The slain lamb that we've already encountered in Revelation, this is explicitly an image of nonviolence and the consequence that it bore for Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the one who shows up for battle already wounded. Second, we hear that he wages war, but specifically he wages war with dikaiosune. Now, this word in Greek is pretty straightforward. What's interesting is actually the English. See, dikaiosune means what is right. And in almost every language, that's how it's translated. Hebrew, Spanish, French, they all have a word for dikaiosune. In English, we don't. We have a word for what is right in society, that's justice, and we have another word for what is right morally, that's righteousness. And here, the translation that he wages war with justice is fine, except that it makes us tend to think automatically of things like punishment and law and rules and retribution. When perhaps to say that Jesus wages war with righteousness would bring us back to where we started, the images from Isaiah, caring for the widow, the poor, the fatherless, the foreigner, that's the righteousness God accepts. So it's all in there, but the English isn't helping us, it's steering us to one side. Still, you might say, okay, he has a sword though, that's pretty violent, right? Except again, John is explicit about this sword. He tells us it comes from his mouth. You are not meant to picture someone here pulling a sword out like a sword swallower. This is a very common biblical metaphor. Isaiah tells us that the Messiah's words will be like a sharpened sword, and Paul tells us that the sword we carry is the word of God. So this is not a weapon. In fact, you basically have to ignore biblical context to imagine Jesus holding a claymore here. Jesus' only weapon, if you can even call it that, is his testimony or the way that he lived in the world, what we see in the Gospels. Finally, though, we hear that he treads the winepress of God's fury, and honestly, in my opinion, this is the best one yet. Remember how John is using Isaiah as a template for Revelation. Isaiah imagines the story of God getting bigger and bigger each time he tells it until God finally writes the world and the cosmos, sets everything to the good. That's exactly the model John follows in Revelation. It, things get bigger and bigger, more and more massive. Except Isaiah is still very much rooted in an ancient world full of conquest and battle. And so this is how he describes the final coming of the divine warrior. Isaiah 63, who is this coming from Edom, from Bozrah, with his armaments stained crimson? Sound familiar? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress, Isaiah asks. And the warrior responds, I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered on my garments and stained all my clothing. So that is the image John is playing off here. But you see what he's doing with it in Revelation? He says, yes, evil will meet its ground zero, and yes, the Messiah will come to right the world, and yes, salvation will come in the darkest hour to overcome evil. But here's the thing. In Jesus, we discover that all of it is even better than we had hoped for. Because the blood isn't the blood of God's enemies anymore. The blood is what God suffered to heal the world. And God's war will make things right, but it will be waged with righteous compassion, not religious violence. The sword will cut deep, but the sword is the truth of the way of self-giving love that Jesus showed us in the world. 
You see, Christ transforms even our most optimistic images of God's grace into something even better. 